Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R, Part 15, Preparing Numeric Data. Now, in the last episode, we looked at doing various pre-processing steps for text data. In this lesson, we're going to turn our attention to numeric data and think about some of the things you might want to do, transformations and other pre-processing steps, before you can work with numeric data in your analyses and for modeling. So one thing that is common to do with numeric data before you use it is centering and scaling the data. This is also known as data normalization because the intent of centering and scaling is putting each different variable on the same numeric scale so that a variable that, say, has numbers in the range of 10,000s is on the same scale as one that has numbers in, say, the millions. Because with certain applications, a uh, variable that has factors of 10 larger numbers than another will overpower and dominate certain types of models. So centering and scaling is something you definitely want to do if you're using any models that would be affected in that fashion. So the most basic and common way to center and scale data is simply to subtract the mean value from all the values for each of your variables and then divide by the standard deviations. And that will put all of your variables centered on zero as their mean, and they will all have essentially the same variance or spread, and that will manage to center and scale them. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of how you would go about doing that by hand. If you want to center and scale things by hand, that is possible, but it is a pretty common task, so it's easier just to use a built-in function or a function in a package. So we're going to show here just how to use the scale function, which is built into R. So we're taking some data that we've already loaded in here, and we're going to show scaling it. So to do scaling, you simply use the scale function. The first thing you pass in is the data object you want to scale. In this case, we're just using the MT cars data set. And then you say, do you want to center the data? If you do, put true. And if you want to scale the data, set that argument to true. And then you simply run it, and the data will be automatically scaled. So let's run this and then view a summary of the data just to confirm that the different variables seem to be on the same numeric scales after this is run. As you can see, speed and distance now both have a mean of zero. The spreads aren't exactly the same, but they're pretty similar. They're within the range of, say, two to three. Now, another thing that you might want to do when you're dealing with numeric data is reducing data skew. So data that is symmetric and tends to be centered around a certain value is generally easy and good to work with, but sometimes you'll encounter data that is more irregular. And in some applications, trying to reduce that irregularity and data skew can provide better results. So first, let's just generate some data here and look at a histogram of the SKU, give you an idea of what skewed and normally distributed data looks like. So this histogram here shows normally distributed data. So things are fairly regular and symmetric. And this sort of data generally wouldn't require any sort of pre-processing in terms of reducing skew because it's already nice and even. But if you have a data set like this, for instance, where things are more common around low numbers and then trail off heavily, this would be called right skewed data. And if you have a data set like this, you may want to try to reduce the skew before doing certain predictive modeling and data analytics tasks. So we'll just go into a few different ways that you could transform this data to make it slightly more regular like this. So one transformation you can do is take the square root of all the values. That is what this square root transformed will do. And we'll look at a histogram of it. And another thing you can do is take the log transformation. It tends to be a little more aggressive than the square root transformation. And we're just adding one so that we don't try taking the log of uh, negative values, which won't work. And we'll look at a histogram of that as well and just see what it did to the skew of that data set that we just looked at that was skewed. Let's run that. And you can see that with the square root transformation, the skewed data is looks much more like the normal distribution now. It's not perfect. It still exhibits some right skew, but it's much 
better than it was before. And with the log transformation, again, it's similarly pulled things into a more regular distribution. Again, there is a cutoff here at zero because the values can't go below that. So it can't be have a long tail to this side, but it's going to be a lot more regular than the first one. And for certain applications like doing regression modeling or using values in a neural network, for instance, doing this sort of log transformation can yield some benefits. Another thing to consider when you're working with numeric data is whether you have any highly correlated variables. That means variables that tend to vary very closely with one another. So they're essentially telling you very similar things and including two variables that are highly correlated together in certain models will reduce performance. So it can be useful to identify highly correlated variables and think about doing something to rectify that problem, such as removing one of them or something of that nature. So we'll just show how you might go about looking at whether variables are highly correlated and consider a couple things you could do with them. So to look at which variables might be highly co correlated, you can use the correlation or core function, and then you just pass in all of the columns that you're wanting to look at, and this will create pairwise correlations for all of them. So for this call, we're just going to look at the first six columns of the cars data set and see what their correlations are. So from this correlation matrix here, we can see there are several columns that have very highly correlated values. For instance, miles per gallon are negatively correlated at a pretty high strength, point 0.85, which is on a scale of negative one to one, negative 0.85 means miles per gallon is highly negatively correlated with cylinders. So the more cylinders a car has, it tends to get worse miles per gallon. That's pretty intuitive with what we know about how cars work. Similarly, the more horsepower a car has, the worse gas mileage it generally gets. The more weight it has, the worse gas mileage it generally gets. And you just kind of have to make your own determination as to how correlated things need to be before you want to consider removing them. I'd say if two variables are correlated in the range of 0.9 or 0.95 and above, that's something to consider dealing with. Certainly if it's say 0.99, they're so highly correlated that you're probably not going to benefit too much from including both of them. In this case, we probably wouldn't need to remove anything, but there are some very significant correlations shown here. So three basic options to consider when you have highly correlated variables is you can just leave them be. That's always an option, even if you happen to notice them. Certain analyses and modeling techniques aren't affected too much by things being highly correlated. So that is one option. You could instead remove some of the highly correlated variables. That can be helpful both by improving modeling and also it reduces the size of the data. So that can yield benefits in terms of memory and how long algorithms take to run on the data set. And another thing to consider is combining them in some way. So there are various dimensionality reduction techniques you can use that will reduce the total number of dimensions you're working with, which will end up combining highly correlated features oftentimes. So that is another thing to consider. Um, we're not going to go in depth about different techniques for doing that in this lesson, but know that that is something that you can do. Another thing to consider when you're working with numeric data is whether you have any missing values. In the earlier lessons, in the, when we were working with the Titanic training data, we saw that there were missing values in the age variable. And in that case, we just decided to fill those missing values with a normal value, which was the median in that case. You could also use the mean. But there are other ways of imputing missing data, which is filling it in based on some informed approach about what the value might be. And one of those is using K nearest neighbors modeling, which essentially looks for records that are similar to that one and uses the values from those to fill in the value that you don't know. So we'll just go into how to do that in R. First, we're going to load in a K nearest neighbors library. In this case, we'll use caret and R A N N. So we'll load those in. Next, we're just going to introduce some missing values into our cars data set. That's what this code is going to do. So I'll run that. 
and we can see that we've introduced six NA values into the MPG column. And finally, we're going to use the KNN impute method. That is part of the caret packages pre-processing options. So we'll just show how to do that here. So we've loaded in the caret package and the RNN package, which gives us access to these functions. And to do this imputation, we use the preprocess function. We pass in the data set we want to impute for. In this case, we're passing in cars, which has those missing values we've removed from the MPG column. And now we'll say method equals, and then you pass in all the different preprocessing steps you want to do. Um, we could have passed in center and scale to this method, and that would have centered and scaled the data like we did above earlier with just the scale function. You can do the same thing with preprocess. In this case, we're going to pass in this KNN impute, which means we want the preprocessor to use KNN imputation to fill in those missing values. After you've run that imputation, you then need to use this predict function to apply the imputed values to the data set. So that's what this is doing. We're predicting new values based on the preprocessing processing that we ran up here, and then we're just resaving it as cars. So let's run this and see what the summary of the MPG column says. As you can see, the NA values from the MPG column have been removed, but also the scale of the values looks a bit off. We notice that, for instance, there are negative values here, and in miles per gallon, there's no such thing as a negative value. So what actually happened was the preprocess ran center and scale on it, even though we didn't explicitly pass those in, because for doing KNN imputation, you need the data to be centered and scaled before you run that. So if we want to see what the actual imputed values were on the original scale, we're going to have to convert those back. So to get the MPG values back on their original scale, we can go back to the original MT cars data set and use the values there to convert back. So we simply have to reverse the operations that are done when centering and scaling. So we divide by the standard deviation normally, which means we're going to multiply by the standard deviation here. And we normally subtract the mean, so we're going to add the mean back on. And after we do that, we can check what the original values were and the difference between the imputed values and the original values. So this will give us a sense of how good our predictions were. So let's run that. And we can see that on average, the new MPG values are different than the original ones by 3.6 MPG. It's hard to know exactly how good of an imputation that is. One thing we could do to get a sense of how strong of an imputation method that was is to compare it to something simpler, such as just using the median or mean value to impute the missing values. So let's do that just to compare how much this error com compares to something that would have been simpler. So let's fill in the missing values with the median this time and just compare to our other predictions. So I'll run this and see how much error there would have been if we used the median instead of our KNN technique. So you can see if we had filled with just the median value, the average error would have been 6.26 miles per gallon. So using the KNN method, we actually had quite a bit less error in the filling in those missing values than we would have had if we only just used the median. Filling missing values using something as simple as just the median or mean is a lot easier and faster than running something like a KNN model, which can actually take a very long time if you have a large data set. So it's definitely a trade-off considering whether you want to do something like that in your pre-processing steps. But if you have a lot of missing data and it's important to get them filled in with as much accuracy as possible, you definitely want to consider using an imputation method that's a little bit more complicated but might provide better results than just filling in a single value. So this concludes our look at different things to consider when preparing numeric data for analysis. In the next lesson, we'll turn our attention to a different data type, which we haven't touched on yet, which is dates. Date and time data won't exist in every data set, but it is a fairly common field to see, so it's important to know how to deal with it. So I'll see you next time.